Let's start this third part by looking at some problems related to the second law of thermodynamics. With a 2.56 times 10 to the 6 joule heat transfer into the, an engine, a given cyclical engine can do 1.5 times 10 to the 5th joules of work. What is the efficiency? and how much heat transfer into the environment takes place. So let's take a look at this problem. The efficiency is equal to the work done divided by the heat in the hot um, reservoir. This is going to equal 1.5 times 10 to the fifth divided by 2.56 times 10 to the sixth which is equal to 0 0.5086 multiply that by 100 and that's 5.86 percent efficient. Not real good. B how much heat transfer into the environment has to take place. Well, the work performed is going to be the, the heat in the hot reservoir minus the heat in the cold reservoir. So the heat in the cold reservoir is going to equal the heat in the hot reservoir minus the work. And this is going to equal 2.56 times 10 to the sixth minus 1.5 times 10 to the fifth. And if you do the math here, most of the heat is lost, which also is pointed out by the low efficiency. So 2.41 times 10 to the sixth uh, joules of heat are transferred. The second problem here says, what is the work output of a cyclical engine having a 22% efficiency and 6 times 10 to the ninth heat transfer into the engine. Okay, so that's the hot side. So if we look at that, this, the formula again says that efficiency is equal to the work divided by the heat from the hot side. So that work is going to equal the hot side heat transfer times the efficiency which is going to be 0 0.22, 22%, times 6 times 10 to the 9th, or 1.32 times 10 to the 9th joules of heat. Now what happens to the rest of it? Well, the rest of it goes into the cold environment, which is the second, aspect, second part of this question. The rest of the heat, QC, has got to be equal to QH minus W, which is 6 times 10 to the 9th, minus 1.37 times 10 to the 9th, or 4.68 times 10 to the 9th joules are transferred on the cold side. So th these problems are pretty straightforward. So in this sort of process, we can talk about something called a Carnot cycle. A Carnot cycle is a process, a cyclical process, that uses only reversible steps. An adiabatic step where no heat is transferred and an isothermal step where no temperature change occurs in order to perform work. <coughs> so you remember, here's our isothermal step. <coughs> here's an adi adiabatic step another isothermal step, another adiabatic step. And then it happens again. In this side, heat is transferred from the hot reservoir and there's isothermal expansion. Then there's adiabatic expansion, so there's no heat exchange, so the expansion continues to occur. The temperature falls. Then there's isothermal contraction with heat loss and then adiabatic compression with the temperature going down. 
and this shows that you have a hot reservoir, a cold reservoir. Here's the heat transfer from the warm side, the heat transfer. We've seen all this before. But the, <clears throat> the unique aspect of the Carnot cycle is this use of keeping the temperature constant in part of the cycle and keeping the heat transfer constant in the other part of the cycle. A Carnot cycle, or a Carnot engine, operating between two given temperatures has the greatest possible efficiency. This is the, the, the greatest possible efficiency is this sort of situation. And its efficiency is equal to 1 minus the temperature of the cold side divided by the temperature of the hot side. And just to say, engines that actually approximate Carnot engines greater than 70% efficiency have not been described. So here's a couple of poss here's a couple of situations. Again, we have A here and B. So here's real heat engines that are less efficient than Carnot engines, and I said the greatest that's ever been seen is about 70% of what would be calculated from a Carnot engine. So the first one here, real engines use irreversible processes. That is to say they do not Remember, the Carnot engine only uses reversible processes. And this reduces the heat transfer that can be transferred into work. The solid pro line represents the actual process. The dashed line is what a Carnot engine could do with the same two reservoirs. So you have, here's the large heat. Here's the loss. The difference here is the loss of work because of the processes are irreversible. And here's the loss of heat. You see that there's a lot, you, you lose more heat and you get less work. And that's the point. You lose more heat, you get less work. Friction and other things that occur in the output of a heat engine converts some of the work into heat transfer into the environment. So Here's a work done against friction, so you have heat here that's expected plus the heat lost to overcome friction. So you take this part as well as this, this loss here, and these two things together are a loss of efficiency between the Carnot engine and a real heat engine. <clears throat> I'm just going to skip that one. So here we have work when a real heat engine is run backwards, okay, so if you run your engine backwards, that is you put input of heat, part of the input of work that's done is goes to, to produce heat of friction, and part goes is added to this work to form heat. Now this would be something that would be used, for example, in refrigeration or in something called a heat pump. So in this figure, W prime represents the portion of work that goes to heat into the heat pump while the remainder of work is lost in the form of friction. So you, you, you use the heat from the cold side plus this additional work to pump heat into your home, for example. And this is how a heat pump works. So let's take a look at a couple problems related to this. <clears throat> a coal fire electrical station has the efficiency of 38%. The temperature of the steam leaving the boiler is 550 degrees centigrade. What percentage of the maximal efficiency does this station obtain? Assume that the temperature, the cold temperature, is 20 degrees. Okay, so let's take a look at this. <clears throat> First of all, we know that the Carnot efficiency is equal to 1 minus the temperature of the cold divided by the temperature of the hot and that's going to be 1 minus 293 have to use Kelvin temperatures and 550 transferred to Kelvin is 823 and so the Carnot efficiency here is 64.4 percent And the percentage of the maximum here is going to be 38%, which is what you actually got, divided by 64.4%, or 59% of the maximum possible obtainable efficiency.
which really isn't bad actually. The second problem here it says you have this person who this inventor who says that they have a device that can transfer 25 kilojoules of heat at 600 degrees K to the environment at 300 degrees K and does 12 kilojoules of work is this a unreasonable claim in other words is she claiming something that is actually physically impossible well first of all Q cold has to be equal to Q hot minus W and so Q hot here is 25 minus Q cold or work is 12 so she ends up with 13 joules to her cold environment. Now efficiency, the efficiency she's claiming is 1 minus Q cold over Q hot and if you do the math here you get 48 percent. Now the Carnot efficiency is equal to 1 minus the temperature of the um, cold reservoir divided by the temperature of the hot reservoir which is 1 minus 300 over 600 or 50 percent. Now the Carnot efficiency is 50 percent she claims 48 percent so that's like 96 percent efficient compared to Carnot which is impossible. So the answer is you wouldn't invest in this because she her claim is impossible. Has never been described. Now let's finish up the lecture today talking about entropy. Entropy is the randomness that occurs in a system and it's an irreversible process. When a system goes from state 1 to state 2 its entropy changes by the same amount whether it takes a reversible or irreversible path. That is, whether it takes the theoretically reversible path or the true irreversible path. So in this first situation, heat transfer from a hot object to a cold object is an irreversible process which always is accompanied by an increase in entropy which is shown here. B, in the same final state and thus the same change in entropy is achieved for an object if reversible heat processes occur between two objects whose temperatures are the same as the temperatures of the corresponding objects in the re irreversible process. So what it's saying here is, is that if you have two reversible processes where you end up from one temperature to another the delta S here is going to be the same regardless if you get there by a reversible heat process or an irreversible heat process. And entropy is usually shown in this way that is you start with something like ice which has an ordered, ordered structure and it goes to a more disordered structure in water. The entropy change here has to be positive because you go from more ordered to less ordered. So let's finish up with a couple of problems related to this. A hot rock is ejected from a volcano and cools from 1100 degrees to 40 degrees and its entropy decreases by 950 joules per degree K. How much heat transfer occurs? Okie doke. So, so how much heat transfer occurs? Well delta S is going to equal Q divided by T. And T here is the average temperature from, from 1100 to 40. So T is going to be 1100 plus 40 divided by 2 or and if we change that to Kelvin it's actually going to be 1373 plus 313 divided by 2 and that's going to end up being 842 degrees K so that's the average temperature over the period of time so 
um, Q is equal to T delta S, which is equal to 842 times um, 950. And if you do the math here, you get 8.01 times 10 to the fifth joules. The second problem here states the sun radiates energy at 3 times 10 to 3.8 times 10 to the 26th watts from a surface temperature of a 5500 degrees centigrade into dark empty space. The effective temperature of deep space is absolute almost absolute zero. What is the increase in entropy in one day due to this heat transfer and how much of the work is made unavailable? So first of all, delta S is equal to Q over 1 over TC minus 1 over TH. And this is in your book, by the way. This is going to be, now, this is per unit of time, watts. So we have to say Q divided by time times the time involved. So this is the number that's in the problem times this 1 over TC minus 1 over TH again. We put some numbers in here. We get 3.8 times 10 to the 26 divided by, or excuse me, times, this is uh, one day, times in that old 86,400 seconds in a day. This is joules per second. times 86,000 seconds times 3.15 minus 1 over 5773. If you do the math here, you get 1.04 times 10 to the 31 joules per degree K. And the work unavailable is equal to delta S times T0, which is equal to 1.04 times 10 to the 31 times 3.15, or 3.28 times 10 to the 31 joules. OK, then. And that completes our lecture today.